and he will tell us and he will tell us about solen solenoidal points in strange attractors please uh thank you very much dominic um thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation it's nice to be here it's the first time that i'm here in uh in level and yes i will tell you a few things about uh solenoidal uh, points in strange attractors and this is based on a joint work with uh, Anna Anosic uh, from uh, USP Brazil and well basically I will mention three papers of ours um, one uh, the first one is uh, a joint with uh, Lori and Hank as well uh, and that this one was is based completely um, on tent, uh, tent maps, tent inverse limit spaces. Uh, and then the second one uh, was published recently. And uh, I'll tell you something about joint work in progress, uh, work in preparation uh, that we are doing just now. Uh, okay, so here is Anna. And actually uh, we did uh, part of this research that I will tell you now, uh, when I was visiting Sao Paulo, I was pretty lucky. It was end of the year 2019, November, December. And I, I've decided to go on a longer two week trip in Sao Paulo. It was, it was great. Uh, but yeah, this was, this was the last longer research trip that I did. Good, good old times. Uh, okay. So a motivating problem is that uh, if you are given a one-dimensional continuum, and by continuum, I mean compact connected metric space, uh, try to give a useful characterization of points that are solenoidal. On the other hand, non-solenoidal. So they have, uh, so neighborhoods, uh, their neighborhood is of uh, some uh, zero-dimensional set times uh, arc. So you can think about Cantor set times uh, arc or not. So this red one uh, on this left part of the picture, I will uh, say that these are inhomogeneities or non-solenoidal points. And these are non-solenoidal points as well. But if I would choose a neighborhood of a point somewhere here, that would be a solenoidal point for me. Um, and we will see what I mean by useful uh, characterization a bit later in the talk. Uh, so, so the needle points uh, are connected to uniform hyperbolicity, as uh, we all know. And for instance, uh, here on this first picture, I have a dyadic solenoid. Um, it's it's a space it's a continuum uh, for which every point is a solenoidal point uh, well by the way it, it cannot be in ah, okay doesn't matter i just want to say it cannot be embedded in in uh, in the plane but then I, <laughs> the, this this is another talk uh, <laughs> okay sorry for this um it, this won't be important at all um and I want to mention at this point a result of uh, Williams uh, that was mentioned also by Sonia, which says that if you have a topological graph or a, a CW uh, complex and you have a map, and with a map, I will always mean a continuous surjection, uh, which satisfied this expansion condition. And uh, this means that if you take an open set, um, then the diameter of the image of this open set is uh, greater or equal than the diameter of, of, uh, of the origin, of the original set. And in addition, if uh, for every point and every natural number, there exists a neighborhood U of X, so, so that F, on, so that some, so that this power uh, F on the power of N of U is an open arc. So sort of it, it collapses all the, let's say branching point, then every point in this uh, inverse limit 
and I will tell you on the next slide what inverse limit is, uh, well, Sonia already explained, uh, is solenoidal. And then if we have an extra assumption, with extra assumption, uh, William sh uh, showed that these um, inverse limits exactly model all uh, uniformly hyperbolic uh, one-dimensional attractors. Um, and this additional assumption is um, that uh, every point is non wandering But, oh, okay, so it is this talk. Uh, so plicking, in addition, gave, gave the conditions so that the inverse limit uh, is embeddable in the plane. Okay, so I was right. Uh, I just wanted to give comparison with the solenoid. Solenoid is not embeddable in the plane. Um, right, so um, now you already know what uh, inverse limit spaces uh, are. And uh, I, uh, um, for GN, so th these factor spaces on which I build the inverse limit are, will be topological graphs for me for this talk. And we have continuous uh, surjections without loss of generality, we can assume surjections. Otherwise we could just crop the map. And then we construct inverse limit as the collection of all possible backward orbits. And we put this uh, natural product topology on the space, which makes the whole space um, contain compact connected metric space, all right? And then um, I will say that I have natural projections and these are just projections on the coordinate spaces. And um, yeah, it turns out that every, uh, such constructed inverse limit is a one-dimensional continuum and Freud and Tal in 30s showed that um, you can model any one-dimensional di one continuum as inverse limit uh, on, on topological graphs with, with continuous surjections and these, uh, these can be even chosen, these can be even piecewise linear if you'd like for simplicity. Right. Um, but then we restrict to single bonding maps. So if, so here I, I was using FIs, different uh, maps, uh, possibly different maps, FIs. But uh, for the rest of the talk, I will restrict to a single bonding map. So uh, every, so FI will be F for every I. And then we have this uh, shift or natural extension of F, we can define this uh, shift homomorphism, just applying F to every of its coordinate. And basically we shift to the right and here we place F of X zero, as Sonia already uh, nicely explained. And then there is a, an important result, uh, a very nice result by Barch and Martin in, from the 90s. Uh, and they basically gave a construction how to embed uh, every such inverse limit space, G hat, I will denote it by G hat. This is inverse limit with a single bonding map in, uh, in R3, so that the shift homomorphism extends from this G hat to, uh, to the whole space, to the whole three-dimensional Euclidean space, R3. And actually this G hat, this space uh, constructed on, on the topological graph, uh, this inverse limit becomes a global attractor. So basically every point will be attracted to this G hat. So they gave this nice, very nice uh, construction how to do that. And um, with some additional assumptions, you can, uh, you can uh, claim that uh, this G hat is embeddable in the plane. And this was given by Boylan, the Carvalho, and Hall. And well, actually, this is called boundary retract. If you can uh, squeeze, so if your factor space, uh, so sort of you are, uh, you have some, an example is pair of pants, and then uh, figure eight is the factor space on which you squeeze the whole pair of pants. This, this is a boundary retract. Or if you if you take a topological disk. You can uh, squeeze it, for instance, on interval or a triad. No, interval. Sorry, not a triad. 
And then uh, there is uh, this uh, very nice recent result by uh, Jan and Sonia, which says that uh, there exists a dendrite or a metric tree uh, and a continuous map on this dendrite so that the dynamics on Hanon attractors for Benedict's Carlson parameters uh, is conjugated to the shift homomorphism H. So sort of, uh, it's, it's nice that we can um, sort of approach the study of this solenoidal and non-solenoidal points through this inverse limit construction. So we are thinking in this direction, but sort of today I won't speak about um, metric trees, about dendrites. I will work only on finite graphs. Okay, and then uh, there is uh, one important result in this aspect uh, by Brian Rains, um, who proved that if we have a map that is an expansion on the on the topological graph G, then uh, he then you can completely characterize uh, solenoidal points. So X from this uh, inverse limit will be solenoidal if and only if is it is locally chainable, and I will explain to you what this means. And um, the natural projections of this point X to the coordinate spaces are not contained in the omega limit set of the critical points. So C is the set of critical points of map F. Um, uh, for some for some n. And basically, uh, when I say a critical point, I mean uh, a point so, so, so graph is not a local uh, homomorphism there. And uh, in addition, C will include for me uh, vertices of, of G of, uh, of degree one. So, and, like. and the omega limit set, omega limit set of uh, this C is the set of all accumulation points of union of the iterates, right? And um, we say that um, X is locally chainable if it can be built as inverse limit on uh, uh, interval times, uh, times, uh, times some finite set. Okay, so think about you, you, you locally, you don't see uh, triad like things or loops. Okay, so this is enough for the for the intuition. Um, right, and we can skip this. It doesn't. It won't be too important for us. And uh, a model, a toy model for um, um, interesting behavior, uh, are tent inverse limits, so tent inverse limit spaces. And here I restrict only to the course, to the dynamical course of tent maps. And for instance, here I have one picture, uh, two pictures of how these, how the approximations of these inverse limits look like. And uh, here in the end, I, I have, um, I, ha I have four pictures that show how locally points look like. So they are either endpoints uh, of this type. So basically we could, we can think about these inverse limit spaces. Uh, we can sort of align the arcs uh, in this, uh, so horizontally like here, and then we can distinguish the neighborhoods of the points and uh, either there are th these ordinary endpoints like uh, on this first picture, or they are uh, not endpoints, but on, so, so I say non solenoidal points, or uh, endpoints of such type. It's type three, so they are sort of spiral endpoints. So we have some arc that is spiraling to this point, which is an endpoint, or we have uh, that this is an endpoint that is not contained in any arc. Uh, and one problem that is very interesting to me in this aspect is uh, this one. So we could determine that uh, these 
uh, type three union type four are typical in this uh, in the whole family of tent inverse limit spaces for the slopes between square root of two and two, but we can determine which one of them is topologically typical. This is sort of interesting uh, fine topology uh, question that is still uh, open there. And yeah, th this is mentioned in that uh, paper with Lori, Ama, and uh, Hank that I've mentioned first. Okay. And uh, well, uh, here I wanted to share how you can think about uh, inverse limit spaces of uh, unimodal maps. So, sort of, you have this, you have your favorite, um, uh, say, tent map. And this is a period three tent map. And sort of, you can, uh, you first, you, you first thicken up the interval and then you place inside a copy of a folded uh, a thickened version of the interval. So sort of a, how graph looks like and sort of you need to take care that uh, you have all the critical points being mapped here vertically along these um, so this is zero, this is one, and this is the uh, this is uh, one half. And sort of you do this procedure uh, um, inductively, and sort of you you get as a nested intersection, you get the inverse limit. So you can think about it in in this way. So here we have only period three. The critical point has period three. So actually we will get one two three endpoints that will be permuted by the action of the shift homomorphism. And yeah, our goal is to characterize points uh, locally in terms of these dynamical properties of the map F on the graph. So sort of we, we understand uh, dynamics on, on graphs pretty, uh, say, yeah, intervals graphs pretty well. And we want to use this to say something about solenoidal, non-solenoidal points in these attractors. And uh, one part of the study was uh, done, but this is, uh, this is a result from that second paper. Uh, it turned out that the notion of a long zigzag map is, uh, plays a pretty crucial role. And a map is called a uh, long zigzag uh, intuitively if, every of these uh, zigzags will, after, after iteration, it, so the zigzag won't uh, decrease in the diameter to zero. So sort of if you iterate this map, you, you could see that you, you would have more and more uh, zigzags that would be smaller and smaller and smaller in the diameter. And sort of we want to avoid these cases. So that's what the definition of long zigzag map brings to us. So sort of we are avoiding in the inverse limit, this space is basically a double spiral, so spiraling from one point, spiraling to the other point to this fixed point. And for instance, we are not taking care of examples like this one. This is actually a Henderson map that gives Sudward in the inverse limit. And here you also have tiny Tiny pole, uh, tiny tiny zigzags inside, and actually uh, these long zigzag maps are a pretty wide class of maps. So if you have a piecewise uh, monotone map that is locally eventually onto, then it's a uh, long zigzag. So uh, piecewise monotone, I mean finitely many critical points, and locally eventually onto, I mean that uh, if I take any open interval. Uh, I can find some iteration that will cover the whole interval. Okay. So, and I'm we are I'm pretty happy with local eventually onto because they are sort of building blocks for other interesting. Uh, so, so if you look at the inverse limit, uh, and you know what uh, locally eventually onto maps are doing, then uh, those that are not locally eventually onto and are interesting, uh, 
they are sort of some renormalization happens and you are you can still be pretty happy with this you understand what is happening on those renormalizable parts um, right and then an older result that i wanted to mention at this point is uh, is this one we we completely characterized under the assumption of long zigzag uh, we completely characterized uh, points that are non-solenoidal so a uh, point is non-solenoidal if and only if it's contained in the, uh, so if and only if all projections are contained in the omega limit set of critical points. So it's necessary and sufficient condition. And I'm slowly running out of time. So basically uh, main point of the proof is that we are not allowed to have such small pat uh, zigzag patterns locally. So this is, this is the crux of the, the technical crux of the proof that we are using all the time. But if, if, if we have an arc that goes, so yeah, if we have an arc, uh, then it either goes from this part of the box till this part of the box, or if it turns, it will need to turn and go back. And in such a way, we know how these folds are created because otherwise we would we could have a double spiral in between but double spiral is well topologically it's you can straighten it out and it's just an arc right so it, it, it's not an inhomogeneity it's not um, yeah it, so this is this is the technical thing that we are using why long zigzag maps are so important because we have long right and this is quite a lot more general than what uh, Reigns had in his paper. Uh, okay, and we are interested in generalizations to topological graphs, and this is uh, working preparation. Um, and here we have also, we need to deal with the ramification points. And when I say a ramification point, this is a point that has, um, uh, if you if there is a continuum that contains this point, if we remove the point, then the this continuum will fall into at least three components. And these ramification points are not locally chainable, and they're thus not uh, solenoidal. Uh, and what is also important is uh, are the branching points and what these maps do with, with the branching points. So we say that branching point is non-collapsing if for every open, uh, open set U uh, that contains G, uh, so that B is contained in this U, uh, the, the image is homomorphic to zero one. So it, we sort of have this collapsing, smashing. And um, actually, if we have um, a point, so that every of its coordinate is a non-collapsing branching point uh, of G, then X is a branching point of an M odd. So it's pretty simple. It's just an M odd uh, ramification point, which is an M odd. So, and um, this this point is the yeah, branching point. But on the other hand, the converse does not hold. So for instance, you can you can have uh, like on this example, you have a graph G and sort of uh, map F squeezes this part, this part and this part towards C and sort of from, from these two tr triads, you get a four up. Yeah, but C is not a branch, right? Originally, it's not a branch. So it's more to it than just this collapsing mechanism, right? So uh, how much time do you still have? Ooh, okay, good. Uh, so then, well, uh, a few more words about ramification points. Uh, so, the, okay, so we characterize these um, ramification points in, the, uh, in these inverse limit spaces on graphs. And the condition that 
was very important here, a pretty also a pretty general condition, uh, is, is this one, non-completely retracting. And uh, so sort of with S, I'm denoting the set of critical points and recall that the endpoints are contained in the set of critical points as well, plus the branching points. And then I say that uh, F is non-completely retracting if every arc, uh, so that, yeah, if, if, so basically the endpoints of the arc are either yeah, a branching point or a critical point, there exists some uh, constant delta, which is dependent on this A, so that the diameter of when we iterate this A with F is, is larger than delta of A. So basically we don't want a complete uh, retraction of some parts of the graph. Uh, and some, and this, these parts of the graph uh, of the graph are governed by by this decomposition. So we have C union B, critical points union branching points, and endpoints. And yes, we could prove that um, under this condition, non-completely retracting piecewise monotone map. So we had to assume piecewise monotone as well, finitely many critical points. Uh, we could uh, we could characterize the ramification point. So a point is a ramification point if and only if the um, uh, every xi is a non-collapsing branching point. So we don't have collapsing on every of on, on any of the coordinates. So basically, actually, uh, in this setting, we even get just finitely many ramification points in the in the inverse limit. But well. Otherwise, a pretty wild stuff can happen. Just we have finitely many of these ramification points. This is that's what it is written here below. And okay, two minutes, I guess. Um, right. And then one other thing that um, was very important was to. So now I'm here in this uh, gray box. Uh, we had to isolate the set of branching points that are sort of pretty special. And they're special in a sense that from, from this branching point, you get a critical point in the second iteration. So basically B tilde is the set of branching points uh, for, for which uh, we, we can find a non-branching point X. So this one, this X is non-branching. Uh, and this X maps to B, but then in the second iterate, uh, it, it collapses, but it creates a critical point. Uh, and then a question is, uh, well, so sort of a straightforward way how one would like to continue is uh, generalizing that theorem of range that I showed you. Uh, would be just to say, okay, if all the projections are contained in this set, C union B uh, tilde, then maybe uh, X is uh, non solenoidal but that's not really the case. We need some extra assumptions as this uh, example, for instance, shows this simple example. Sort of uh, for this example, we drag, uh, uh, for, uh, so this, this, uh, arc from this arc from X to B is dragged up uh, and the rest is sort of uh, stretched around and this X will be a fixed point it will eventually so this this arc will disappear in the inverse limit and it will be a solenoidal point but X will also be contained in the omega limit set of this special branching point. So this is just to show you that we need some additional assumptions. And what it turns out to be uh, true is uh, that if we assume non-completely retracting plus long zigzag, that condition that I was, was explaining to you earlier, then we have complete characterization of non solenoidal points. Uh, so they are either ramification points or their projections. All the projections will be contained in omega limit set of this C union. Uh, tilde. Okay, and that's it. Uh, happy birthday.
Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Online now also. Okay. Not uh, very closely related. There was a theory by Williams mm -hmm. in higher dimension, branched right. manifolds, which is very difficult paper. I, I don't yeah. know whether it is correct. Uh, I don't know what is the situation. Yes, Did you try to do something in this direction? No, uh, we didn't go to higher dimensions. We sort of want to understand these better. So sort of, it's not completely satisfactory that we need to have these restrictions, not completely retracting and long zigzag, but zigzag, but we sort of want to generalize as much as we can, and then also look from the other perspective. Another thing which I just reminded was Lubitsch and mm -hmm. I forgot who else paper about in holomorphic dynamics ah. about inverse limit and again visits of critical points uh -huh, close to our point right. influence the and persistent the, uh, the, the, the unstable manifold in inverse limit right I, I, uh, I think maybe the term persistent recurrence uh, so it's some, something right here there. it's more complicated yes because there the mapping is open and right. here it has such faults mm -hmm. yes but uh, i i think the the notion of persistent recurrence appeared in the, in that paper that you are mentioning yeah. Yeah. and we that that played a very important role in the first paper that i've mentioned mm -hmm. where, where we characterize different uh, types of, of uh, folding points and basically it was sort of uh, we, we gave a correct characterization if we have a folding point uh, that is endpoint then uh, necessary and sufficient condition is uh, is this uh, persistent recurrence of the critical point so it was some very nice connection that we didn't expect uh, to appear but this term was uh, originally defined in complex domain. okay uh, are there any more questions uh, if not, then let us thank the speaker again. And we have like uh, six minutes to the next talk, right?